Tawau, welcome. There is always room here. I would like to invite Mitch to come back and do the land recognition to start us off. The day I was asked to do the land acknowledgement for this meeting, I had an interesting conversation with one of my staff who happens to be a First Nations person. They really aggravate him. So often they're just words. When I, was, when I was a part of a group here at Westwood that read through and discussed the Truth and Reconciliation Committee report, I believe that was seven years ago, we grew to understand that the best thing we could do to help and make progress towards reconciliation is to listen and learn about the history and the present conditions of Indigenous and Métis people on whose lands we live, work, learn, and play. That is a part of what we are here to do tonight. It's not about making statements, political or personal, it's about listening and asking questions, and it's a part of what we can do so that the words of acknowledgement are not empty. Many of you, like me, until early, earlier this month, may not know that the Westwood website has many resources to help connect people to Indigenous, other, to indigenous people, their culture, and reconciliation work. One of the things that was recommended to me as I prepared were uh, the resources to, around territorial acknowledgments. A couple of things in those resources resonated with me. Make it relevant, and what is my own story in relation to Indigenous people? Bruce Coburn was an important part of my growing up. In 1997, he released an album that had the song Stolen Land on it. It ignited the embers that had been in my heart for some time and led to further learning about how the land we live on has been stolen and the consequences of that theft. Stolen not only from those who signed Treaty 6, not only from the Métis people who have also called this land home, but from peoples, animals, and the land itself who could not or would not be a part of that treaty. It is in recognition of that fact, the present reality, and honoring those who have come before, that I share the lyrics of that song with you now. From Tierra del Fuego. Yeah. To Ungava Bay, the history of betrayal continues to today. The spirit of almighty voice, the ghost of anime, call like thunder from the mountains. You can hear them say it's a stolen land. Apartheid in Arizona, slaughter in Brazil. When bullets don't get good PR, there's other ways to kill. Kidnap all the children, put them in a foreign system, bring them up in no man's land where no one really wants them. It's a stolen land. Stolen land, but it's all we've got. It's a stolen land and there's no going back. It's a stolen land and we'll never forget. A stolen land and we're not through yet. In my mind, I catch a picture, big black raven in the sky, looking at the ocean, sail reflected in black eye. Sail white as heroin, white like weathered bones. Rum and guns and smallpox can it change the face of home in this stolen land. Well, if you're like me, you'd like to think that we've learned from our mistakes enough to know that we can't play God with other lives at stake. So now we've all discovered that the world wasn't only made for whites. What step are you gonna take to try and make things right in this stolen land? Stolen land, but it's all we've got. Stolen land and there's no going back. Stolen land and we'll never forget stolen land, and we're not through yet. Thank you, Mitch. And to all of you here tonight, thank you for being here, for being part of this. We really do appreciate it. And I'm going to be introducing our speaker in just a moment. I would like to thank him for being here for his wife for being here, and for everyone who has joined us on Zoom or who might join us later on Zoom. This will be, is being taped and it will be put on our website so you'll be able to find it after or if you have friends who missed it and 
and would uh, like to see it as well. Ron has quite a few slides and you might not be able to read them all while he's talking about them, so you'll be able to look at them later. Okay, so you don't need to worry about missing out. So in his current position as bilateral treaty coordinator, Ron is actively involved with the elders and leadership of the Confederacy of Treaty Six First Nations and has spent over 45 years working diligently for rights, for treaty and land rights, natural resources rights, environmental protection, traditional subsistence rights, cultural rights, language rights, children's rights, health and self-determination for Indigenous peoples in Canada and around the world. We are so honored to have you with us tonight, Ron, and that you could speak to us. Ron's full biography is also on our website, so I, and I'm sure he will share any further details that he wishes to share tonight. So I am going to, I would like to thank you for joining us this evening. We are very honored. Hi, hi. How no Akumagantik Nigana Tatam Scat now, Kakio, Mias and Peter Gotigota, P. Michiti, Mina Ectap Tagogaya, Muipogo, Kitayak, Maga, Uskai Sino Gati, Peter Gotichik, Kapapa Magots and Sigason, Yagua Kisuguxin. Ni so we hone gave me go on. Eogan months tamaya. We cask, I see no casaska, a pamagotig, sweetie. Sco the gauchit be taxiac, a cochtawino, dig up my Good evening, everybody. <clears throat> Just wanted you to hear uh, one of the languages of this place, and it's uh, Nihiawion. Uh, other well, otherwise known as Cree, and uh, just letting you know that uh, I'm glad to be here and glad to see so many and uh, glad that I'm not the youngest or the oldest here. I'm somewhere, <laughs> somewhere in the middle there. Uh, a lot of places I go, sometimes I'm almost the oldest. And um, <clears throat> so it's good to see a lot of uh, elderly uh, people here. And uh, I was telling you that uh, my Cree name is uh, name. Um, my first name I was given. I'm named after the sweetgrass smoke. When you light sweetgrass, it travels all over. And uh, the elder that uh, gave me the name, that's the way he saw me. Because of my work, I go all over the place, uh, around the world, uh, across the ocean, and uh, that's how he blessed me and how that uh, sweet grass can always bless me. So I always have some with me and I light it when I, <clears throat> you know, when I'm talking like this, but uh, we did that before we came here because we know this is a, a church and uh, we wanted to respect that. Uh, the second name I was given uh, very recently by my brother Jerry Saddleback is uh, Sky Elder. And that's the way he saw me and the way that he uh, uh, gives names. He dreams about it. He prays about it like that. So I just wanted to let you know that. And uh, <clears throat> my English name is Ron Lehman. I'm from uh, Beaver Lake Cree Nation. And I've been doing this kind of work since I was a very young person. And in my lifetime, I met many, many elders, old people that pass their words on to us, not only me, but uh, <clears throat> people my age and, and younger. And so what I'm going to be sharing with you today is not my knowledge. It's knowledge that was passed on. And uh, I was told uh, that I need to pass that on too. So where I'm at today, I have uh, 30 grandchildren. 20 grandsons and 10 granddaughters and three great grandchildren. So uh, uh, the work I do, I have a very 
big vested interest. I think about how things will be for them in the future. And I think about my great grandfathers, my great grandmothers, the ones that I saw in my lifetime. <clears throat> that's the way they thought about me. And that's why I'm here today. So I can do no less for my, my top ones. Uh, I want something good for them in the future. So I just wanted to uh, stay, say that at first. And uh, I have a, a PowerPoint that I want to share with you. And, um, and the first one is uh, about this place right here. And the second one, if I have time, uh, is about the work I've done uh, internationally. I was just telling a lady here that um, I'm one of the people that helped to uh, draft the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. I was a very young person that time, some 40 years ago or so. So, uh, <clears throat> and I'm glad that um, it's being recognized. It, it was a fight, I'll tell you. Canada did, didn't just sit there and say, yeah, go ahead, yeah, we agree with you. They've, they fought us all the way. Right to the 2007 when it was uh, approved that the General Assembly, uh, Canada, US, New Zealand, Australia, those were the four that didn't uh, uh, <clears throat> sign on to it. So anyway, this is, uh, I work at the Confederacy of Treaty Six First Nations, and uh, I've been there since the beginning. I'm one of the founders of the, the organization, and I'm the only one that's there now that was there in the beginning. Uh, a lot of my colleagues uh, went on to the spirit world and uh, I, I really miss them, but uh, I think they would want me to continue this work. So this is uh, uh, their, their knowledge. Next. <clears throat> uh, this is uh, something that's very interesting. You've probably all seen it. Um, I told you that uh, my grandfathers, my great-grandfathers, they, they passed this knowledge on to us. But now today, there's such a thing as grand, Grandpa Google. You just <laughs> Google and it pops up, you know. You can even Google this, I'm sure. It's called a Declaration of First Nations. <clears throat> and I was there when it was drafted. It was uh, just west of Edmonton here, a place called uh, Camp Hihoha. And the original document is somewhere, some lucky person has it, where all the old people that were there, the leaders, they, they signed on to it. It was a big, long document. But basically, this is what it says. We, the original peoples of this land, know that the Creator put us here. The Creator gave us laws to govern all our relationships, to live in harmony with nature and mankind. The laws of the Creator defined our rights and responsibilities. The Creator gave us our spiritual beliefs, our languages, our culture, and a place on Mother Earth of which she pro provided us with, uh, with all our needs. We have maintained our freedom, our languages, and our traditions from time immemorial. We continue to exercise our rights and fulfill the re responsibilities and obligations given to us by the Creator for the land upon which we were placed. The Creator has given us the right to govern ourselves and the right to self-determination. The rights and responsibilities given to us by the Creator cannot be altered or taken away by any other nation. So that was true in uh, 1980, and it's just as true today. And um, uh, the kind of work that uh, my colleague and I here Miranda, the kind of work that we do, we see this every day, how roadblocks are put in our path. And uh, reconciliation is talked about, but we're not seeing it as it should be. And uh, it's only through uh, these kind of gatherings that it can really happen. People can really start to understand um, why we're here and what is happening here. And, um, and uh, I was listening to all the people talking here, and 
very interesting the different views that people have. Next, <clears throat> these, these are the number treaties. There's 11 of them. And uh, it starts with Treaty 1, uh, 2, 3, 4, 5, and Treaty 6 is the one in the green, right in the middle of uh, Alberta, Saskatchewan. And there's two Treaty 6 First Nations in Manitoba, a total of uh, 54 First Nations. And it was uh, entered into in uh, 1876. And then there was subsequent adhesions. Uh, the little part up there around La Ronge and uh, Montreal Lake, that area, that was entered into in uh, 1889. And um, when they had their 100 year commemorations, uh, I went to some of them, uh, some of the adhesion. I even went to that one. It was way, way in the, in the forest, way out there, uh, isolated place, very beautiful. And uh, so I, I went and uh, spent some time up, up, up that way with them. Uh, next, <clears throat> and this is Treaty 6. It's not a good map. We used to have really good maps, but for some reason now, uh, old Indian affairs and uh, the ones that do maps, they don't do that anymore. They, they used to do these maps that had, had all the Indian reservations on there. They used to have them and the treaty territories. But for some reason now, they don't make those. But uh, it's not the biggest treaty, but it, it is a very uh, uh, good size area. And I'm biased, in my opinion, it's in the most beautiful <laughs> part of the country. <laughs> and one of the richest places uh, in the whole area. So uh, uh, that's uh, Treaty 6. Next, <clears throat> uh, pre-treaty, we were talking a little bit about that uh, today. Uh, next, <clears throat> this is uh, some of our beliefs and traditions. I won't go through uh, each and every uh, uh, slide here because it'll take too long, but this is where we were put on this continent, the Creator put us here. And the way our old people say, Kagismoaski, that means uh, prayer sanctuary. That's, that's what our people called us. And they called this uh, place an island, uh, Minstik. That's what they call this, uh, this land. That's all of uh, North America. And um, uh, so next. Of course, we all believe the same way. There's only one creator, but the creator has helpers that he depends on. That's the way we, we call them. Put them in the four directions, in the sky, in the earth. And those are the ones that we uh, pray to, to help us to get the message to the creator. I can't put it any simpler, but... Uh, and it's not that simple. There's a, a lot to it. And, uh, but I'm, I'm not uh, uh, the kind of person that uh, leads any of these. I'm just telling you about it. So I don't really, really have the right to go into detail either. I just share with you what I can. Next. <clears throat> anyway, I talked about this uh, with us. Mother Earth here is really Mother Earth, Kigawi no. Um, and our history of creation story, us Cree people, straight south from here, south and a little bit east, in a place around Cypress Hills, that's where our creation story is. The Creator took us from this earth and uh, made us with, with the earth. And then he depended on his uh, helpers to breathe life into that person, the, the lightning, the thunder, to put that, uh, that life in that person, that, that fire, and the, and the water too. And uh, so that's a long story in itself. But these are the kind of things that we as uh, indigenous people, Cree people, this is what we have to learn. And... Uh, I'm at the age uh, where I learned a lot of that when I was growing up. But then uh, I'm uh, 
sort of a victim of the residential schools too. But they didn't take the Indian out of me and they didn't take the language out of me either. And um, I, I'm glad about that because this way I can pass on what I've learned to uh, uh, the younger people. And uh, so this is a, a history of creation story. I'll talk a little bit about that right now because the, the problems we're having today, the dilemmas, the opioid crisis, everything, the suicides, all of that that's happening at the nation's level, at, at my, my reserve, my wife's reserve, different places. It's all because we were taken away from this. Up to about 70 or 80 years ago, almost every clan knew this uh, history of creation story. And within there are all the teachings. What happens to you when you step over the Creator's law? And in my language, we call it Bastahun. So you were taught about that as you were growing up. So it isn't so much a fear, but a respect. What would happen to you if you overstep the Creator's law? And that's why a lot of the young people that time uh, were very well behaved. You know, they listened to their elders and, and all that. They weren't doing this all day. But, uh, and that's the reason why we're having these problems today. And uh, <clears throat> luckily for us, there's still people that know this. And they're, they're uh, sharing it, they're passing it on. And my hope is that it's going to make a comeback. And if it makes a comeback at the nation's level, we're going to see really serious changes where things are going to turn around for us. But uh, there's so much that's in our way each and every day, just the way of life that we're living now. But uh, my one of my adopted fathers uh, from Rocky Boys, uh, he said, prayer can change things. And I believe that. So I always tell the young people where I work, don't put that aside. Because our elder, our elder people, when I was young like them, that's exactly what they told me. Don't put that to one side. You put that to one side and uh, there's going to be consequences. And the way I am, I don't want to see those consequences because I love my great-grandchildren, my grandchildren. Next. <clears throat> And I won't go through this, but these were uh, the leaders we had way back then. This is a pound maker, but they were very kind people. They showed by example. You know, it's not like cowboys and Indians in the movies, not that way. It's the kindness that they have, the example that they showed by being a good hunter, by being a wise person. And in some cases, they were spiritual leaders like this one here. Next, this is Poundmaker, and this is Big Bear. And uh, way back somewhere, that's one of my ancestors too, Big Bear. He was from around uh, uh, Onion Lake, uh, Frog Lake in that area. He, he was from over there. And uh, he ended up, uh, they ended up down in Rocky Boy. And uh, he came back, he finally entered into treaty and uh, Fort Walsh, which is uh, down by um, the border, close to the border there in uh, Cypress Hills. But um, when the incident happened in uh, Frog Lake, he wasn't even there. He was up north uh, in the Coal Lake area. He was, it was a very hard winter and he was trying to get some food and, and hunting. He was away that time and yet, uh, him and Poundmaker were the ones that ended up in Stony Mountain. And I've been to Stony Mountain, not a good place. But uh, it's funny, um, they couldn't keep uh, Big Bear in the lockup. He kind of went out any time he felt like it. Yeah, and that's a whole other story too. Next. <clears throat> and this is uh, treaty time. Next, and this is a, a treaty of uh, 
because uh, us, we talk about our collective rights, and that's what's really different from uh, um, the rest of uh, society. When we went to uh, the U when we first went to the UN back in uh, late seventies, early eighties, uh, at the UN it's all about individual rights, and uh, the concept of collective rights was brought into the the UN by us, and uh, they fought us. You know, they you know they said, well, don't you respect individual rights? And we told them, yes as long as it doesn't take away from the common good. And all of our ways are about that, the common good. Individuals are respected, but more the, the collective. What happens if you do something that affects the collective? Then there's going to be consequences. Like uh, a, a good example is the buffalo hunt. And um, my great, great grandfather, was one of the leaders of the, the buffalo hunt, just, just not far from here on the plains. And uh, they would come from all over and they would gather on the plains. And uh, every buffalo hunt needs a, a leader or leaders. So it used to be either him or this other man from Sad Lake, his name was Big Louie. And they didn't call him Big for nothing, he was... Uh, <laughs> from what, what I hear, and, and this is a oral tradition that was passed on. And uh, my great-great-grandfather's name was John Whitford. He lived over here in uh, St. Albert. And uh, so he was one of the, uh, the leaders of the Buffalo Hunt back in those days. And he had a Cree name, they call him uh, Uma Chisk. That means somebody who likes to hunt. That's, that's what they called him. Anyway, uh, this is... Uh, Again, collectivity and reciprocity and compliance. So not only did the crown uh, make commitments, we also made commitments too. And history will tell you that we lived up to our commitments. The crown not so much. And that's why we're having so much uh, trouble today trying to uh, explain to them, hey, this, this is the agreement you entered into. It's not just you and us. We called upon, upon the Creator too. That time we depended on the Creator to be a witness. And that's why it's important. A lot of people don't realize that part of it. It wasn't just a party between the two nations, but uh, the Creator was called upon to be a witness. And uh, I was just reading a, a document for our, from our Treaty 6 hearing in 1983 in Sad Lake. And many, many elders were alive that time. And they kept over and over again saying, no person with two legs can ever break this treaty. It's to last as long as the sun shines, the grass grows, and the rivers flow forever. They depended on those powerful forces of nature to... Uh, and they call them skaikana, that's what they call them, to uh, show how long this uh, treaty would last. And as long as our people are here, that's, that's the other part of it. Um, <clears throat> next. <clears throat> Another thing was about uh, our different ways. Our people were very intelligent, you know, uh, regardless of what might have been written in the books. But you have to realize most of those books were written by other people other than us. Our people were very, very intelligent. They saw a lot of things that were coming down and they wanted to make sure that we were taken care of. And they talked about education. Uh, you would have to learn the ways of the people that are coming here in order to survive in that world. And uh, so they made a way for us. They insisted on uh, uh, education. And uh, they talked about this even before the treaty was entered into. I'll give you an example. Um, on my father's side, uh, through my grandmother, um, Chief Pagan from uh, 
uh, Goodfish Lake, Whitefish Lake, uh, James Seenum. Uh, he was my great, great grandfather. And uh, this uh, man came from back east. His name was uh, uh, Reverend Steiner. And uh, he lived among the people. And he, uh, they built a schoolhouse. And he was teaching the, the little uh, Cree children uh, how to, uh, you know, like school today, how to read and write and, you know, to uh, uh, cipher and, and all that kind of thing. That was before treaty. So when uh, Pagan went to uh, Fort Pitt to the treaty, he already had that in his mind, that he wants education, a schoolhouse. So he insisted on that in, uh, in Fort Pitt. Another thing that happened was uh, in 1870, they just went through a, a big pandemic, went through the whole area. A lot of people died. And that was in his mind too. So when he went to Fort Pitt, he insisted on a medicine chest to take care of the sicknesses that we don't know how to take care of, the ones that were brought to our people. And also he insisted on uh, Fam, the famine and pestilence clause was in there because of uh, the work that they did, insisting on that, because they saw how the the pandemic uh, the, the sort of uh, killed so many of their people. The only way uh, the stories go is that uh, they just had to totally isolate themselves. They wouldn't let anybody in or out to the point where if somebody try to come in well they would make sure that he didn't come in and uh, that's how much they uh, guarded uh, the safety of their uh, their clan the the people in their families uh, next <clears throat> again uh, th this is a good one I always laugh about this anyway there's this myth of uh, the doctrine of discovery, and you all heard in the news when uh, Francis, uh, the Pope, came over here. He came to uh, Muscochis. He went over to Lake Saint Anne, and uh, and then later on he sort of did an ap apology, sort of. You know, it's not exactly, but um, and uh, this is still giving us problems today. The whole thing about terra nullius and, and all that, uh, I think you uh, understand a little bit about that. Uh, the proclamation was, if you find a, a land where there's not a Christian king in charge, well, it's yours. It's empty, take it. You know, and, uh, and it's really unbelievable to me because of the stories that I know. I think we were more Christian than a lot of the people that got here. Anyway, um, uh, next, I'll just go through these real fast. Sorry, I don't want to take a lot, of, a lot of your time. But this is one. This is one I wanted to make sure that you saw. I'll, I'll tell you a little story before I go there. Back in... Uh, the late 70s into the early 80s, when we first went to Geneva to, to do the work that we had to do, there was no money for that work, so we had to raise funds just to get a ticket to go over there. And then uh, enough money to maybe get a place to stay. We stayed in hostels and many, many places that uh, I'm sure nobody would stay in. But um, luckily, some of the South American brothers from Peru and Chile down that way, they were working at the World Council of Churches. And uh, so we met them and we didn't have a place to meet. We used to have indig indigenous caucuses before we went to the UN. So they said, well, come and meet here. So we started meeting at the World Council of Churches for quite a few years. And uh, they learned something. <laughs> this is it here. Uh, this is an excerpt from the WCC meeting they had in Switzerland in 2012. 
So uh, you can read it, and you can read it uh, when you have a chance. But many, many things that they would never would have said when we first went to the World Council of Churches. But they were good people. They sat back, and they uh, let us meet there, and they were listening to what we were saying. Otherwise, they wouldn't have this in there. Uh, next, <clears throat> I want to read you the, the last two. Calls on each WCC member church to reflect upon its own national and church history and to encourage all member parishes and congregations to seek greater understanding of the issues facing Indigenous peoples, to support Indigenous peoples in their ongoing efforts to exercise their inherent sovereignty and fundamental human rights, to continue to raise awareness about the issues facing Indigenous peoples and to develop advocacy campaigns to support the rights, aspirations, and needs of Indigenous peoples. Finally, encourage uh, member churches to support the continued development of theological reflections by Indigenous peoples, which promote Indigenous visions of full, good, and abundant life, and which strengthen their own spiritual and theological reflections. And that's what your, your people are doing here. And uh, I really thank you. Uh, when I made this uh, presentation, and I had a lot of time that time, I, I was invited by uh, the Pres Presbytery, I think they call them, in uh, Edson. It was the meeting of all the churches, I guess, throughout uh, the province here, right to Saskatchewan. A lot of people there. And I read every one of this, uh, these uh, paragraphs to them. And um, when I finished, I turned around and I said, how many of you have seen this? Not one hand went up, not one. Then uh, fast forward a few months, I was invited to uh, Sherwood Park to a meeting there and some of the same people were there. And so I, I did this again. And when I asked the question, how many of you knew about this? How many of you Googled it or whatever? Look, quite a few more hands went up, but uh, you can Google this too. You know, all of this, it's uh, there for the record now. But I uh, now you know a little bit of the history why this happened. It's because they were kind to us. They let us uh, meet in their place where they pray. Well, we we met there, and they were listening, and uh, so this is what uh, <clears throat> comes out of that. Well, you all know who's not part of this, huh? <laughs> the Holy See. They have their own seat at the United Nations. They're not part of this. But, uh, you know, they can't say they don't know because they do. We tell them time and again, time and again, that when uh, Columbus got lost and he landed in, uh, in the Caribbean over there, he didn't discover us. He was lost. His uh, people were dying of scurvy and starvation, and our people saved them. Yeah. So that's a little bit of the history. The history I learned when I was going to school was not like that. But, you know, through my life, I learned uh, the real history. Next. <clears throat> and this one to me is important. Uh, this is one of the elders, a good friend of mine, and he's been gone quite a few years now. One of his daughters works in our office. His name was uh, Pete Westcott, very well-known uh, person. He, he, this is, uh, he told this to me because uh, that's one of the things that I do is I interpret I, and I translate and, um, you know, I can uh, hear it on a headset and I'll type it on and uh, translate it. And uh, so this is my interpretation of what he told me. Uh, during the discussions in Fort Pitt, there was a, a, an old man there, his name was Sasaguapisk. And he, he got up and he wanted to ask uh, or talk to the commissioner Morris. And this is what he told him. I heard that you as a representative of the, the queen talked about buying my land from me. How can that be possible? That can never happen, and I will tell you why. 
even if you were to place your money one after another from where you come from across the ocean where the queen lives to where I'm standing here today, you would still never have enough money to buy this land. The reason is that where the Creator put me, He put me with everything that I will ever need for all time. That is how rich, bountiful, and life-giving this land is, and that is why this land is not for sale. That was in 1876. And, um, you know, we're all smart people. We all read. We can all look at maps. We can look at the globe. You can take uh, the British Isles, and you could probably fit them in one corner of Alberta here. So who could think that that little country could ever have enough money to even buy Alberta, <laughs> much less uh, Canada? So it didn't happen. This land was not bought. My ancestors did not give this land up. All they agreed to was to share this land so that the Queen's people could come here and make a living. That's all. Next. <clears throat> yeah, go ahead. And I won't go through this. This is about our bi bilateral discussions. And um, they started in 1996. We did a lot of good work from 96 to 99. Uh, we worked with the federal representatives, and uh, sometimes we had to agree to disagree, but we came up with what's called a joint report. And uh, it's just telling the story of the discussions that happened, what we uh, uh, noted as uh, further discussion is needed, what we agreed upon, what we didn't agree upon. We came up with a report. It made its way through the system, got to a... Uh, uh, Minister Robert Nault, and he refused to sign it. So the process was put on hold. We were told, well, keep doing your research. But now it seemed like we're going to be able to dust off that, that uh, joint report and get back to the table and talk about the real issues. I'm hoping. <laughs> Next. <laughs> and again, uh, like she said, you can... Read this at your own leisure. Uh, right in the bottom, it says, treaties are the, the original reconciliation between Treaty First Nations and the Crown. So when you read it, you'll see, uh, and this is not, this is from the work I do with uh, some people that I work with. And they have their input, elders, technical people that I work with. And uh, these, this, these words on these documents are their words, the words from their ancestors. And, and uh, I just put them in the English language. Next. <clears throat> and this is, of course, a UN declaration. Um, <clears throat> the following preambular and operative sections of the UN declaration, declaration recognize and affirm the importance of indigenous treaties in the reconciliation between indigenous and non-indigenous peoples that aim to bring about peaceful, mutually beneficial and harmonious relationships. And this is uh, right in the, the, the preamble part of the, the UN declaration, recognizing also the urgent need to respect and promote the rights of indigenous peoples affirmed in treaties agreements and other constructive arrangements with states, considering also that treaties, agreements, and other constructive arrangements and the relationship they re represent are the basis for a strengthened partnership between indigenous peoples and states. Uh, next. <clears throat> and this is Article 3, and this is the one we had to fight and fight to get this into the UN Declaration. Um, because if you read the covenants that are there already uh, at, uh, at the United Nations, uh, civil and political rights, economic, social, cult cultural rights, Article 1 says this. It says, all peoples have the right to self-determination. By virtue of that right, they freely determine their political status and freely pursue their economic, social, and cultural development. And in there, it says all peoples. 
That means us too. But guess what? When all of these were elaborated in 1948 at the United Nations, guess which people weren't there? Us. The black people were there, the yellow people, and the white people. But our people were not there. So after Wounded Knee and all the things that happened there, uh, the elders told us to uh, go internationally to reach out to uh, form relationships, to, to get help from other people from around the world. And that's what we did. And that's how we ended up at the UN. Article 7 is the one on treaties. And when we first sat down to uh, um, talk about this part, we only talked about treaties. But governments, it's sort of a give and take. Although we had a difficult time doing it, we agreed to include agreements and other constructive arrangements. But treaties are the ones that are international. Ours are international because our treaty is with the crown in right of Great Britain and Ireland. That's the difference. The treaties they're making here today are domestic treaties. They're not international like ours were. Are, I mean, they were and are. Next. <clears throat> so this is one. Uh, I think I almost used all my time. But I do have another one that I really want to share with you because uh, it shows you the work that we did internationally uh, right up until today. Uh, the UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, he came here in March. He came to our youth conference, and he uh, was a keynote speaker for our youth. And he also was here in an official capacity to look at uh, the issue of the mass graves that were found. And he came up with a report. You can Google that report too. So um, if it's okay with you, I can go through the, uh, the deck. Uh, I won't spend a lot of time with it, but you might find it interesting. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yes. okay. This is 1977. I personally wasn't there, but ironically, I guess shouldn't be surprised, many of our old people from here went to this meeting uh, from uh, Goodfish Lake, uh, the Bulls, uh, William Bull and his wife, they went from Muscochese. Uh, some of the elders from Muscochese went to this, this particular meeting too. And uh, Indian people, indigenous people, have been trying to get, get into the UN for many, many years, back as far as the 1920s. A man from uh, the Iroquois, the Onondagas, uh, the Skahe, he tried to get, get into the United Nations and they wouldn't let him in. And a man from, uh, a Maori man from New Zealand too, they wouldn't let him in. But the city of Geneva welcomed them and uh, made them welcome and they hosted them and before they went back to, came back to North America and back to New Zealand. But this was the first time we were able to get into the UN. These old people, You'll see the pipe there. They uh, literally kicked the door open for us. And uh, I went to the, the 30th, uh, let's see, 30, 50th anniversary of, of this. And um, many of these people were gone already. Um, <clears throat> this first gentleman here, his name is Philip Deer. In 1983, we went to a conference at his place in Okima, Oklahoma. And um, very powerful people, very uh, uh, spiritual people. And uh, you, you, you'll know, you will have heard some of these names. I was just kind of uh, commenting to my wife. Uh, a lot of people here are a bit older than me. They're, they saw the hippie generation. So they might have heard about some of these people. These are my friends. Some of them are gone now. Uh, this one here, his name is uh, Bill Means, William Means. You've heard of uh, Russell Means. 
he's there too. Uh, Clyde Belcourt. Um, so these are some of the, the, the leaders of that movement. And they're the ones who uh, occupied Wounded Knee back in 1973. We had uh, uh, the anniversary commemoration in February. There was a blizzard, so I couldn't make it. <laughs> Didn't make it over there. But uh, next, and that was the first meeting. But I did go to the second meeting. I went to a meeting there in 1980 and 1981. 1982 is when we uh, established uh, the working group on indigenous populations. So this is uh, uh, what happened uh, in 1974 in Standing Rock, South Dakota. And uh, the UN declaration comes from this declaration here of continuing independence. And uh, so in June of, 9, of 2024, next summer, our 50th anniversary of, uh, of this historic meeting. And uh, many of our people were at this meeting too, back then. Uh, next, <clears throat> and this is the working group, uh, that gentleman on the far right, that's Philip Deere, the one that was in that other picture. And the one on the far left is uh, Vernon de Belcourt. And the one next to uh, Philip Deere is uh, Thomas Banyaka. He's a Hopi, uh, he was a Hopi spiritual man. And all these people are gone now. They've gone to the spirit world. So I just want to share that with you. But one of the themes of that for us is uh, treaties, always been. Uh, this is uh, called the International Indian Treaty Council. It's uh, the first indigenous organization with consultative status at the United Nations. And the first to have general consultative status a few years ago. So we've been doing work at the UN for many, many years. And uh, back in uh, 2020, uh, our president, his name was uh, Francisco Cali Say. He's a Mayan uh, person from uh, Guatemala. He was our president. He got chosen to be the special rapporteur on the rights of indigenous peoples. And um, so the rest of the board asked me if I would take the, the, the role of president. So. I, I went ahead and I took it because my elders always told me when people depend on you to do something, don't step back. Maybe you can help out somehow. So just do the best you can. So that's what I'm doing right now. Uh, next. <clears throat> and this is uh, Professor Martinez, Miguel Alfonso Martinez. He did the international study on treaties agreements and other constructive arrangements. And uh, he finished his uh, report in 1999, but he, he began his report right here in a place called Onion Lake, right on the border of Alberta and Saskatchewan. Uh, he came over there and he spoke to our elders. Our elders gave him a testimony. And unfortunately he passed away a few years ago but uh, you can Google his report too. Very excellent report. Uh, next. <clears throat> and uh, this, really interesting. I didn't make it to this meeting. I had another commitment, but uh, our executive director, the one that works with us, she was at this meeting and she called me. So I was listening and uh, she said the vote just just uh, they just uh, had the vote and it passed and it was a huge uh, applause and uproar and uh, that's in the General Assembly. There was only four that voted against it and that's uh, Canada, Australia, New Zealand and uh, US. US, yes. And there was a few yellow, but not that many. Yellow is uh, not neither here nor there but uh, it passed overwhelmingly. And uh, so this was a historic moment and uh, I just thought I'd share that with you next. And it's a minimum standard. And uh, 
you have to understand we were sitting across the table from these uh, nation states and Canada was there every step of the way, their heels dug in. You couldn't get anything without them making a comment. And then on top of that, they reserved the right to uh, uh, change their decision uh, if they saw fit. So they were there, but a lot of this work that happens at the UN, not everything, not all the decisions are made in the assembly halls. You go to the coffee shops, to the lounges that are there, and a lot of the lobbying is happening there. And I happened to be in uh, one of the coffee shops there during a break. And uh, Canada didn't, didn't see me. They were sitting in the corner over there. And uh, some, I just, I still remember some of those guys. Uh, and uh, I overheard them saying, uh, oh, no problem. Let them have whatever they think they can achieve. But when it leaves this body, then it's going to be ours. We can make the changes that we want. So having heard that, I went to my colleagues in the Indigenous Caucus and I, and I told them what I heard. So we drafted a resolution insisting that we're, we're involved every step of the way where the UN Declaration was being uh, elaborated. So we were involved every step of the way except for the General Assembly because we're not part of the General Assembly. And uh, so that's what happened. So Canada didn't exactly have their way like they thought they were going to. Uh, so it's a minimum standard with a lot of uh, give and take. Next. <clears throat> Again, this is one of the preambular uh, sections. And it talks about inherent rights and lands, territories, and resources. Next. <clears throat> And again, Article 3, I don't have to repeat that, but it's exactly the same as Article 1s of the covenants. Only thing we put in indigenous peoples, it says all peoples, but it seemed like we didn't count as peoples. So that's why we uh, insisted on being involved in this process. Next, lands, territories, and resources. These. This is a very... Another uh, section that Canada really fought, the United States really fought hard about, uh, including Australia and New Zealand, because they're colonizing states. And uh, they didn't want to recognize that we have the right to these lands where the Creator put us, like what I said in the UN, in the Declaration of First Nations. And uh, we really stuck to our guns as much as we could. And the thing about free prior and informed consent, it's not a veto like Canada says, well, it's a veto. No, it's not. It's if something is going to be happening in our land, we need to know about it. Not at the end where they bring you a document, you got 30 days to respond. You know, that, that that's not free prior and informed consent. If somebody has a bright idea about developing this or that, they need to come to us and say, hey, what do you think of this? Is it a good idea? What can we do about it? That, that's free prior and informed consent. Or, you know, they, it's not them coming to you uh, with a handful of money and saying, hey, look at, here's some money, you know, we're going to do this. No, that's not free prior and informed consent. Next. <clears throat> And uh, this is important, the international standing of treaties, because uh, in the study that uh, Martinez did, and he studied treaties all over the world, and he insisted, he found out that the treaties made here are international in nature, because they were made with the crown. They weren't made with Canada. Canada is not part of the treaty. Canada is a successor state, so they inherited the obligations for the treaty. That's what Section 9124 is about. It's not for them to lord it over us. It's for them to uh, fulfill the obligations uh, in the treaty. 
Next. <clears throat> Again, free power and informed consent. And this was, uh, you all know about this. You saw it on TV. Standing Rock. Uh, I went there and it was very eerie. It was like, a, a, I don't know, a, like a, a police state. There was FBI, army all over surrounding that place, you know, because people were standing up for their rights. You know, why should it be like that? That's not uh, reconciliation. Next. And, uh, you know, the sad thing about it is uh, it wasn't only Indigenous people that were saying that. The non-Indigenous people are just as concerned about the water, too, because the aquifers, if they get contaminated, that's drinking water for the whole area there. There's a huge aquifer there. So, um, you know, we're not only thinking about ourselves, but we're, we're thinking about everybody, animals, too. And here, um, it's about Treaty 6, and, uh, it, and it's the, the thing about free power and informed consent, and that's taken right out of uh, Treaty Number 6. Next. <clears throat> and um, another thing that happened through the years is uh, the Organization of American States they started the process of a, a, a American Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, so a hemisphere declaration, uh, the Western Hemisphere. At the beginning, we weren't part of it because we were busy with the UN Declaration, but when that was uh, sort of, it seemed like everything was okay there, then we joined uh, the OAS Declaration process, and I was there to many, many of the meetings. And uh, the treaty language in this one is stronger than the one in the UN Declaration because it talks about uh, um, in accordance with their true spirit and intent in good faith. And it also has in there, the, uh, in the bottom, these, um, when disputes cannot be resolved between parties in relation to such agreements, treaties, agreements, and other constructive arrangement, these shall be submitted to competent bodies, including regional and international bodies by the states or indigenous peoples concerned. And that's really big because uh, these courts here, they're not ours. We're one party to the treaty. Um, the crown is the other party to the treaty. So is it fair that we go into their court I think there has to be a different process that I think there has to be international oversight, uh, the international uh, court of justice, uh, that kind of thing. So that's some of the th conversations that we're having now. And um, uh, next. Yeah, this is uh, another one, uh, something that happened in uh, Mount Rushmore. That's one. Um, uh, Trump went over there to uh, campaign in this uh, sacred area that's sacred to the Lakota people. So they had a protest and, of course, they got in trouble. Next. And uh, almost done. Um, and this is my friend. Uh, we call him Pancho. Francisco. Francisco Cali Tsei. And uh, he came to uh, our uh, meeting here at the River Cree. And this one in particular is about what happened on Mount, Mount Rushmore. And um, once in a while we get to see him. We, we saw him not too long ago here. Uh, next. <clears throat> and this is another body that we use quite a bit. It's uh, called the UN CERD. And uh, it's a place that you can go to for uh, urgent action and early warning uh, measures. They have that process within, within that uh, treaty. And Canada is a part of this treaty. So they need to fulfill <laughs> the obligations to the, the, uh, the CERD treaty. Uh, next. 
Yeah, and MRIP. MRIP is another body at the UN. When the um, Working Group on Indigenous Populations uh, finished its work or was discontinued, then uh, the permanent forum was uh, established in New York. But there, there's also the, the MRIP. It's called the Expert Mechanism on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And they meet every summer in uh, Geneva, Switzerland. And it's been a while since I've been there, but uh, I might have to go there again sometime soon. But uh, just to, and again, uh, you can read this in your, when you, when you have time. Next. Yeah, this one too speaks about conflict resolution. And uh, I think that's very important. And uh, we need to really consider that. Uh, next. And this is a, a picture of one of the, the treaties down in the US. I believe that's uh, the 1868 treaty in uh, Fort Laramie. Next. And uh, again, this is uh, comments from the special rapporteur when he came to Canada. The relationship of indigenous peoples with their lands and territories has a central role in defining their identity as distinct peoples. I repeatedly heard during the course of my visit that true reconciliation can only be achieved by respecting existing treaties and providing restitution and compensation for the loss of lands, territories, and resources. And uh, that's when he came to, uh, to Canada here. And, uh, I was sort of his chauffeur. I drove him around, set up meetings for him, and uh, took him to uh, Muscochis, and uh, uh, our elders said a prayer for him, took him to a sweat. And uh, so it was pretty good to have him here. And uh, he came up with a report, and you can Google that report too. Excellent report. It's uh, the report of uh, his visit to Canada. It was an official uh, visit. Uh, I think that's almost the end of this. Good. Next. That's it. That's the last one. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your patience. I really wanted to be able to, <clears throat> to show you uh, this part because uh, uh, it's important to know that we don't just sit around here. We're trying to we're trying to do something, and that's how much we care for the children that are coming and those poor children that never made it home, you know, those kind of things. So uh, thank you for your attention. Hi, hi. Uh, um, if you can, thank you, I have a mic. So if you, I know you have a long ride ahead of you, but are you willing to take a few questions? All right. So. Out of respect for people who might have hearing difficulties, we would like you to use the mic if you're asking a question. So if you just stick your hand up, I'll come around with the mic and hold it for you so that you can ask any questions that you might have. I'm wondering when you went to the United Nations with indigenous peoples from with indigenous peoples from all over the world, did you have language problems that you had to yes, deal with? We did. We did. Uh, but luckily, a lot of the indigenous peoples uh, um, south of the U.S. Canada border uh, or the U.S. Mexico border, most of the indigenous peoples south of there speak Spanish with uh, Portuguese, I think, uh, Brazil, and in the Caribbean, quite a, quite a bit of English. But we had a lot of indigenous people that uh, were able to interpret for us in our indigenous caucuses. Of course, in the UN, uh, interpretation is uh, provided in all the official languages. But yes, uh, as a matter of fact, one of the people that worked at the World Council of Churches, uh, he was a man from um, Chile. His name was uh, Eugenio. Uh, I guess Eugene, uh, he didn't like it, I call him Eugene, but uh, that's Spanish for uh, Eugenio is his name. And uh, he would uh, help us 
and and uh, different people that uh, were part of the delegations were able to help us. Yeah. And is there any questions? Hello. If there are any questions from our guests that are on Zoom, we would invite you to either put them put them in the chat or raise your hand, and our folks, our tech people, will get them to us. All right. Anyone else? Thanks, Ron, for your presentation. I'm wondering if you can just speak to a couple of the things that are happening currently that Treaty 6 is trying to get recognition of. Well, right now, uh, I guess uh, the most important thing is to uh, get back to the table with the government. And uh, over the years, we've done a lot of research. and. Uh, I think now we're at the cusp of uh, being able to get back to the table and uh, uh, further those uh, discussions. Uh, where you stand on, stand on the Indian Act, like it seems to be a very cruel document, if I may say so, and what's, yeah. what will happen with that? Well, Luckily, we have a person uh, in, on our staff that's an expert on the Indian Act. And uh, matter of fact, she wrote a, a book on the Indian Act. And um, I won't be sorry to see it go, but there's some very fundamental things that need to be looked at. And uh, one is uh, lands. Right now, they're protected within the Indian Act. Uh, citizenship and uh, tax, the tax exemption. So if um, something can be done to uh, safeguard those, then I'll, I'll say goodbye to the Indian Act. But until that point, uh, I think it would do more harm to just Offhand, get rid of it. Um, I'm wondering about the Sovereignty Act of Alberta, and I know Saskatchewan because Treaty Six is in Saskatchewan and Alberta. Yeah, I've always wondered if that was, you know, not just to our benefit, but I mean, what does that mean for the treaties, the Sovereignty Act, and the Saskatchewan created an act as well. And almost in the same time, yeah, just in the last year. Yeah. yeah. So what is your answer? We dealt with it at the last All Chiefs meeting. And we also, uh, uh, we didn't just pass a resolution. We sent, uh, put them on notice that uh, we totally disagree with it. Because what land are they talking about? So this is not their land. Because another illegal thing that happened was in 1930, 1905, 1930, when my ancestors uh, entered into Treaty 6, nobody told us that uh, the province of Alberta was going to be created, province of Saskatchewan, wasn't even talked about. They didn't come to us and say, well, is this okay? We want to do this. It might have been okay if they came to us, but they didn't. So there was no uh, consultation or free prior and informed consent. And further in 1930, the provincial government and uh, the Canadian government, they uh, uh, lobbied uh, the British Parliament to pass uh, the Natural Resources Transfer Act of 1930 without talking to us. Remember, this is how much our ancestors agreed to share not anything under so that was uh, totally illegal and we're, we're having conferences on the nrta we just had one in uh Ermanskin at muskwachis uh, this summer and a lot of uh, uh directives were given on how to move forward so we are doing things about it we're not just like i said we're not just sitting around <clears throat> anyone else anyone else 
Say more about what, what you just said about what our ancestors agreed to share. We yeah. didn't agree. I, I'm not, I, don't, I don't know that. Okay. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, and uh, back in 1983, we had a, a Treaty 6 hearing in Satellite Cree Nation. Uh, there was four jurors that we got from uh, different parts of the country, from the United States and Canada here, four of them. And uh, they sat and listened to elders' testimony for four days. And they came up with a document. And uh, in the undisputed, many, many instances where the elders, and I can attest to that too, I was uh, one of the interpreters at the meeting. Uh, the elders said that uh, all the commissioner Morris, the, the Queen's uh, representatives, all they asked for was a place to make a living, to be able to uh, farm, to raise their uh, uh, livestock. And uh, they asked for some uh, trees to uh, build their houses and grass to uh, feed their uh, animals. That was it. And uh, uh, some say this much, uh, the depth of a plowshare, that's what, that's what they say, so that uh, the Queen's people could make a living. So it was uh, uh, an agreement to share. Uh, just remember, just think about this. At the treaty time in 1876, uh, very few if any of my people spoke a word of English, not a word of English, they depended on the interpreters. And um, the story is told that uh, a lot of the things, when they got back to uh, Winnipeg and then to, uh, was it Upper Canada or Lower Canada? I can't remember, back in those days, the things that they wrote down is not what was agreed to in Fort Pitt and Fort Carleton. Like the whole thing about seed release surrender. Our ancestors did not agree to that. So, yeah. Someone else? You talked about international treaties and then about Canadian treaties are what are there some Canadian treaties? Yes. And yes. what are they? Today, uh, they have what they call the BC treaty process. And that's uh, a treaty between the government of Canada and uh, First Nations in BC. Our treaty was with the crown and right of uh, Great Britain and Ireland. It's an international treaty. The treaties today are domestic treaties. Are there many domestic treaties? Or Quite a few, Quite yeah. A few? yeah. And um, not only are they calling them treaties, they're calling them uh, self-government agreements. Mm -hmm. Like up in the Yukon, they have that too, self-government agreement. So just in a uh, follow-up to that, does Great Britain and England and Ireland ever take any responsibility for the treaties or do they just hand it over to the Canadian government? Oh, that's a long story. How much, <laughs> how much time do you have? <laughs> well, uh, when, when the patriation was happening, you remember that? Yes. Yeah. A whole bunch of us went to Great Britain to talk to the House of Lords, to talk to the Parliament and tell them, just hang on. There's a process that needs to happen before you hand us over to the Canadian government. And they circumvented a, a, a constitutional conference on treaties. That's what should have happened first. But there was so much going on with uh, Quebec and all that. You know, they're still scared of Quebec about separation and all that. And um, so the constitutional conferences that they agreed to, that's unfinished business. It was never finished because of uh, the threat that uh, uh, they saw uh, with Quebec trying to secede. So 
Um, and um, another thing about that too was uh, right about that time when they were having the constitutional conferences, that's when we had that Treaty 6 hearing in Sad Lake. And uh, it's a good week for me. Last week and this week, we finally got the material together from those, uh, uh, the jurors. Uh, one unfortunately passed away. He was an older gentleman from uh, Lar Laramie, Wyoming. His name was uh, Carol Hurd. These are all lawyers. And uh, the, other, uh, the other two I found, uh, one man is from uh, Massachusetts. He was from uh, Connecticut back then. He lives in Massachusetts. And this other lawyer is from uh, Selkirk, Manitoba. And she sent me all her, the whole package. Everything's in there except for one page. So I'm waiting for the, the man from um, Massachusetts. Uh, he's sending me all his material. So maybe that one page that's missing is in there, along with his his findings. So, yeah, it's slowly coming together. And uh, I just think 40 years ago, you know, already, I was only nine years old that time. <laughs> so when you negotiate, you only so when you negotiate, do you only negotiate with the Canadian government? Uh, not, we don't negotiate. Uh, uh, negotiate what? When you were talking that you're going to start discussing with the government. So is that Oh, with... yes, yes. Uh, the Crown. The, the Crown is still here. We're still, you know, uh, we got a new uh, king now, King Chuck. But... <laughs> <laughs> but uh, representing the crown, yes, we're sitting down with them. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. I know that Ron is driving back to Beaver Lake tonight, so I think, and we are indeed so thankful that you took time out of your obviously very busy schedule to be here with us tonight. And just before everybody runs out the door, I would also like to give some thanks. Would the people who are on the organizing committee, if you're up here right now, could you just stand up for a second? You know who you are, all the people who are at those Zoom meetings and whatever. Thank you. Thank you. And if you would like to be part of this wonderful group, you, we are always happy to have new people join us, okay? This is not a closed group. Anyone, you don't need to be a member of this church. Anyone is welcome to be part of this and to help out if you would like to help us plan future things. And speaking of future events, if you've enjoyed these and you would like to help them to continue <laughs> we are most grateful for donations there is a box sarah has a blue box by the door or there's a poster right behind the coffee urns over there that you can take a picture of that has the information of how to send an e-transfer if that's your preferred method of donating things anything over 20 dollars if you um if you identify yourself and your how to contact you, you will be sent a charitable tax receipt because we are a charitable organization. So if you do make a donation that's identified and we can get a receipt to you, we're happy, happy, happy to do that. Okay. Um, so I think did my organizing people, did I miss anything? All right. Thank you so much again for coming out tonight. Thank you. Thank you.